And we are going live, uh, and we are here today uh, with Creative Underground, and we have the uh, rare privilege of interviewing Stuart Schills, who will uh, give you a short background in a second. And uh, on our panel today is uh, Beth and Bob. So, uh, Stuart, if you please uh, take it away and tell us a little bit about your background as we discuss uh, plain air to abstraction today. Sure. Um, I'm Stuart Gills. I live in Philadelphia. <clears throat> I'm native. Um, I came to painting through, um, through literature and architecture, and uh, I went to art school at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts uh, in Philadelphia, where I actually teach now in a part-time kind of way. And... Um, I do many different kinds of things um, besides just painting outside. Yeah, and, and uh, we decided that uh, to keep our uh, talk uh, so it had this one encapsulated idea that we just talked about one aspect of your painting today, and uh, possibly at another date, you know, we could talk about one of the other aspects that you have to offer. Uh, I know with any artist, it's hard to pigeonhole us into just exploring one thing because there's just so many opportunities out there. But Stuart, as a group, uh, we really loved uh, your plein air painting and, and how you took it in to abstraction. But uh, talking with you shortly before the show, uh, you talked to us about uh, you came before the plein air movement. I think it's interesting, uh, as I came before the plein air movement, I started in uh, 1978 and started uh, plein air painting. Um, what did you think plein air painting meant then, or, or what is your your personal perspective on what you think plein air painting or outdoor painting is? Um, what was the last part of your question, um, Carol? The, the very last phrase I, I, I missed. Oh, okay. What do you think outdoor painting is? Oh, okay, so I'll just describe to you how I came to outdoor painting. How would that be? Perfect. So I was trained as a figurative painter, intending to become a, na a, a narrative figure. You know, the, the painter uh, Sidney Goodman was teaching at my school when I was a student, and I was very involved with the idea, I mean my training was in figure painting and portrait painting and I was very interested historically in things like Caravaggio um, and you know other people so I thought I was going to become a figurative painter. I was also extremely conservative. I was not nearly as conservative as people who have come out of the Florence Academy over the last you know, whatever, several decades, because the Florence Academy didn't exist. That's a fundamentalist institution. There's a difference between conservatism and fundamentalism. I, though, as a student, never looked at any art after Courbet. Like, among my group, you know, among my group of Hasidim, you know, like the, the devotees who followed my teacher, we didn't, we didn't consider anything after Courbet to be legitimate. I wasn't looking at Richard Thiebenkorn. Uh, I didn't know who Philip Gustin was. Uh, I, didn't, I detested Matisse. I mean, these were, like, these were like heinous crimes that I'm guilty of. So I went to school with a bunch of guys with names like Bo Bartlett and Vince Desiderio. I mean, they're people who have gone on to become very well known. And there was a whole group of us in this circle of people who were very interested in figurative painting and narrative painting. Um, and I remember when I left, when I, when I was leaving school, I used to sit around with all my friends, and one would say, and most of them were goths, you know, and one would say, well, I'm going to make a six-foot painting. And the other one would say, well, I'm going to make an eight-foot painting. And the other one would say, I'm going to make a 35-foot painting. And the other one would say, I'm going to make a 104-foot painting. And for me, this was like being back in the locker room in junior high, you know, with, with guys who were like talking about like, who's as big as 
So uh, my response to all this was just, forget it, guys, I'm out of here. And I went outside to have a smoke and walk around the block, and I never came back. My idea of going out to have a smoke was to completely derail from what had been my agenda as a student and just, okay, so another critical story, I'd had a fellowship to go to Europe in the summer of my fourth year. And I took gouache because it was very portable and didn't require any solvent. And a friend of mine who had grown up in Florence took me up into the hills of Fiesole, which is a little village outside of Florence. And I would sit there every day for three or four hours making these very small gouaches. And I would take them back to the, my room, and I would look at them, and I looked at them in comparison to what I had been doing as a student, which were very large finished paintings with the emphasis on finish. You know, I didn't even know. Sometimes the underpainting was over the overpainting. Sometimes the overpainting was over the underpainting. So I was making these very gestural notations, direct response, up in the hills of Fiesole, looking down over the rooftops of Florence. And then I got them back in my room. And at the end of the week, I looked at these things and said, this is a bunch of nonsense. You know, this is an art. And I put them, I was buying a lot of books along the way, and I put them in the book, in, in a crate, and I shipped it all back to Philadelphia. And when I got back to Philadelphia three months later, I opened up that book, and I looked at these paintings and realized that something critical had happened in the process of not only my looking, but in the quality of my response. That for the first time, really, because I'd done, you know, we used to go out on the weekends to paint, you know, for fun, but small panels, but I realized that something struck me in this process that I wasn't able to see at the time that I was doing it, but with a little bit of distance, I understood that there was a message for me here. You know, it was almost like I heard the blast of a horn. And um, that summer that I left school, the next summer, when I kind of tossed it all away, I went up to live at my girlfriend's mother's house in upstate New York. And I had an old car, and I would drive around the hills of the Finger Lakes, painting with gouache, trying to get myself back to what had been the lightning bolt that struck me in the hills of Italy, to try to return to that kind of direct engagement with no underpainting, with no underdrawing, with no planning, just very direct response. And that walk around the block, which was intended as just a brief departure from what was intended to be my life, I never came back inside. I was so, I became so engrossed by the process of direct engagement with looking out of doors where the sun is not stable, where things are moving, where there is a lot to see, and something that I couldn't have possibly understood in the life studios of my training, which I now understand in the life studio, which I try to express to students, but something that I came to terms with outside. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really true, that, you know, we can plan a path for ourselves as pain. So once you start out, you, you can't really direct it. You can't control it. And if you did control it, it probably looked like um, You know, your perspective, because uh, you've been around a, a year or so longer than us, is that you have experienced art from uh, a much bigger piece than we ever have. And so it, it's really interesting to talk to someone like you and, and hear things that, you know, we're out of our time zone. I notice that when I talk to young kids. There's a lot of things I assume they know, but they never experienced. They weren't around. And that's what you have to offer. And, um, and the direct painting, which is what most of the plein air painting have uh, utilized because uh, it is that direct response. Um, and then 
the other thing you talked about was uh, coming back and seeing something in your painting. And I know sometimes I could be, I could like something in my painting, and I can some other times hate something that I paint. But when you return to it, sometimes there's an intrinsic value that you uh, see that you you didn't catch at the time. And that's what you saw. You saw something you came back to me. And so were, were you painting at that time um, abstractly, or were you, are these gestural pieces uh, which were very different from you? How did you go about seeing these gestural forms, and how did you end up? Okay, well, those first washes that I'm describing were just, they were just like the first kiss. You know, that then as I settled in, I, I, I used like the next four months for kind of clearing the land. And um, I did a lot of gouache, and I slowly returned to oil painting and, and really started digging in. So initially, I'm making, like to get myself ripped out of what had been studio mind, I'm making 30-minute, 40-minute, 45-minute hour paintings. But that got built up, you know, more and more. And as I dug in, and then, and then when I came, when I realized that I was in the city. I'm not going to go down to the river and make bucolic paintings that look like Hudson River School or that look like Corot. No, I'm not Corot. And, you know, Corot is actually a very radical guy in his time. You know, those paintings that Corot made in Italy, that first trip to Italy in 1826, he couldn't show those to anyone. There was no, there was no taste for that kind of painting. So the idea that we're imitating Corot or imitating whoever is kind of corrupt. I got involved with living in the city where I was, and I started looking at the city. And once I started looking at urban form, I realized I need a lot of time here because this is complex. You know, if I'm going to really dig into looking, if I'm going to try to understand. What's happening here? You know, there, there's so many tiers of issues because you have to deal with composition, you know, design, which you have to hold together all the time. You have to deal with aspects of drawing, which of course is related to composition. You have to deal with color. And then you have to deal, when you're outside, you have to deal with the fact or the idea that when you look at something, there's a lot going on, but you can't, but a painting is not just about an inventory list. A painting is about a specific configuration of relationships of parts so that what I'm after when I painted outside was to hold together parenthetically a moment of looking, which meant that within that whole consideration, there had to be a hierarchy in which different parts receive different qualities of attention. That it wasn't just a matter of moving from part A to part B to part C to part D and doing it all the same. You know, that's academic. That's what you learn in school when you block out the eight heads or the seven and a half heads or whatever it is on a piece of paper when you're drawing a figure and you start at the top. Working outside, there is an immense amount to hold together. So. I started working on paintings for longer and longer times, but they were all informed by what I had learned in that formative period of time in my first years out of doors where I'm working really quickly and trying to understand the idea of the entire painting as a kind of a gestural movement. You know, I don't, I mean, a la prima is a terrible word because there's no such thing as a la prima, really. Uh, I mean, for me. But I understood in those early years that, that painting is drawing. And that drawing with a brush means moving the brush the way we move a snow shovel through snow. So that the brush can move in many different ways through the painting. 
defining qualities of understanding, yet it's not necessarily the same everywhere. But I always wanted my paintings to appear as if they were just thrown down onto the surface, you know, like in one breath. Although, you know, after that very early formative period of time, they never were. I like your uh, comment, uh, and, and you guys might want to ask a couple questions of Stuart too. But I love your uh, comment that uh, a painting is not an inventory list. And I think uh, too many of us have, and it's probably a common flaw, making an inventory list. But you know, looking at it as the whole piece is it, a very important factor. I mean, that that was great. I love that. Well, a per se, a, a painting is a perceptual unity. And a perceptual unity is very different than an you know, The analogy that I always use for my young students at school, I say, look, guys, if you're out on a heavy date on Saturday night and you've had two glasses of wine on your date and you're kissing somebody in the corner of a club, and while you're kissing them, you're looking across the room and you're saying to yourself, wow, I wonder where that person got that shirt. Then, then where are you? You know, where are you? You're not, you're not anywhere. You she know, must not have been a very good kisser, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> she must not have been a very <laughs> good kisser. <laughs> she's so easily distracted. That was an example I used. <laughs> that, that's an example I used in relationship to we are after a perceptual unity in which in the painting we have to understand what is the nature of our kiss with the configuration of what we're looking at, which means that it can, when we look, we cannot encompass or hold everything. We have to that's, make choices. Yeah. That's what I'd like to hear more about, because I think you're very successful in that, and uh, that's exactly what I thought when I saw your paintings, that there's just this beautiful simplicity to them, but it, it's not as easy as it looks, or as simple as it looks. But, I'd like to hear more about what that is, what that you've learned, and how to record that that look that you've achieved. Well, that I mean, you know, this is like a this is like a four month conversation. <laughs> I know. I know. That's, we got to be the that, that, <laughs> Give me your credit card. <laughs> Give me your credit card, and I'll tell you the answer. Right. <laughs> um, so what? Well, the, first of all, that painting is an evolving path, which we all know. It's an evolving path that we can't get to all at once. You know, it's just like we don't go from being seven years old to 80 with a snap of the fingers. You know, um, Everything takes a lot of time, and things are revealed to us. You know, it's kind of like that, that, not that story by Paul Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress, you know, that we all read when we were, like, in college or something. We're on a road, and we meet people on that road, and we have encounters. For me, one of the most pr primary, um, one of the most primary experiences in my life has been the encounter with other art. You know, I I went to Italy, I went to Italy as a student because I had this fellowship. But when I was in Italy as a student, I was looking at Caravaggio and Baroque art and all that kind of stuff. I didn't go back to Italy until I was 50 years old. And I never really looked at the art of the early Italian Renaissance. I had a book in my library this thick about Giotto. I knew who all these people were. Piero, I knew the name, you know, Duccio. But I would never looked at these people with deep focus. And going to Italy for four summers uh, in my early 50s changed my life. And Daryl, you asked me a question about abstraction. And it's kind of bizarre, because after, after living on the coast of Ireland for 13 summers, between 1994 and 2006, or 2007, whatever it was, after those 13 long summers, my painting, I had, I had like lost myself 
in the evaluation in pigment of what a cow looks like across the bay through rain. You know, that's where my, I mean, a lot of people don't know these paintings because these paintings haven't been heavily reproduced and many of them weren't shown, but I had moved into a kind of very atmospheric painting and going to Italy where there was steady, consistent, predictable day-to-day -day sunlight and buildings and looking again at paintings that were representational because I had become immersed for years in looking at abstract paintings, looking at the early Italian Renaissance, strangely enough, brought me to a place where I began to feel as I was working outside that, which I knew all along, that it's all about abstraction. That painting is about nothing else. And by abstraction, I don't mean does my painting look like um, Robert Motherwell or Jackson Pollock. That what I mean is when I was standing there looking at Piero della Francesco in a museum, or when I went to look at a Mirandi, or when I went to look at a Duccio or a Giotto, um, I began to realize that the way these figures or the way these parts of the paintings sit in relation to one another and carry visual weights the same way that when you look at Chardin, that this is what is most important in painting, is a quality of abstraction. And at that point, I stopped painting outside. It wasn't necessary, or you felt that you grasped uh, what you needed to go forward into the studio. I kind of feel like I'm ready to go back into the studio myself right now. But um. yeah, well, I'd never, I'd never been a studio painter. I painted relentless. I believed you couldn't really reconstruct thought in the studio. Now, I draw outside. Um, I mean, drawing is a critical part of what I do, but right. I haven't painted outside. I haven't painted outside in in like four years. Yeah. Um, well, well, we talked about a number of things. That I kind of like to go back over. Uh, we talked about, or well, one thing I, I like is uh, the painters, it's an evolving path. And uh, sometimes I hear painters, they want to cheat art create a shortcut, they think they're going to outsmart everybody, and <laughs> some other painter. They don't, and I'm trying to say, hey guys, you know, it's it's a lifelong path. Look at Rembrandt, he spent his whole life doing this. You're going to have to put the time in. And uh, some people don't like to hear that in our fast food mentality world, but, you know, being an artist is, is a long path. Well, you know, people don't like to hear a lot of things. Um, <laughs> everybody wants a quick answer. You know, if you go to Wharton School in Philadelphia, which is a business school, if you go to Wharton School, if you get out of school and you're not successful in five years, you're a failure. If you go to dental school and you don't have a strong practice in five years, if you live in Philadelphia, there's something wrong with you. Um, we're not those people. This right. is, you know, it's like I tell my students, like, I'm training I'm training like poet soldiers. You know, you, there are no answers to this. You know, I mean, what? because what's a kid going to do? You know, the kid goes home for Thanksgiving or Easter or Passover, and the kid is sitting there at the Thanksgiving table, and the grandmother says, Jane, how's it going? You know, Jane is finishing a PhD in neurophysiology at Stanford. Um, cousin Barry is... Um, just finished law school and is in practice in Boston. Um, cousin Lulu is studying porpoise behavior, you know, at Harvard Medical School in the South Sea Islands. And what's what's Max doing, or or what's what's um, you know whomever Sam doing? He has an apartment and he has a studio, you know, in the inner city, and he's painting. You know, like, how can you explain that to parents who are chief of endocrinology and senior partner of a law firm? Yeah, no way. <laughs> you know, like, we've created a monster. 
you know, yeah. that we've created a culture in which, um, you know, we're under a tremendous amount of stress. You know, um, college students kill themselves all the time because of the stress they live in. So what's a painter to do? You know, like, I don't know how these kids are going to survive in this culture. We need a right. lot of time. No, I, and I know that um, I, I heard in one of your other interviews you talked about that you did whatever you had to do to make it happen. And, um, you know, as painters, uh, it, it isn't the easy, easy path. And, and we shouldn't assume that because we I've had so many people that have contacted me that thought that this is some great way become famous and, and make a lot of money and I you know you need to spend time on the development side but without there's a couple other things that you talked about and I, I really want to get into it and we talked about it off camera uh, yesterday when we talked but um, you talked about that kiss or, or the abstract qualities but and um, that elusive nature that makes somebody want to um, kneel down and cry before a painting because it's so touched them. Where did, where did those kind of things come from? I have my ideas, but I, I just want to hear what you had to say. Where do those kind of things come from, meaning what what makes those paintings? I don't know, I'm just yeah, trying to understand. Yeah. What, what part of the painter is he that or she that can put that down on a canvas that when someone comes up to that painting, they go, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Well, it's a great question, Daryl. I mean, that's that question is like a senior semester seminar in itself. Um, you know, yeah. because you, you've, you've put your finger on, on a very um, complicated business. You know, that's like saying, that's like saying, um, when you read a seven-line poem, why do your eyes sometimes tear up? You know, or when you hear a beautiful piece of music, like why does Mozart rip our hearts out? Um, because right. somehow, you know, these people, because this is what poetry is, you know, and painting is poetry. Um, I, I had a very interesting experience. Um, the first summer that, so I, I used to teach in Italy for a school that I worked for occasionally in Jerusalem called the Jerusalem Studio School. It's now, it's not in business anymore as far as I know, but they used to go to Italy for the summer and for a number of summers I accompanied them and I used to teach at the school in Italy. And I remember the first time I went to see the Flagellation of Christ by Piero della Francesco in Urbino, in the Ducal Palace. I had known this painting. I knew it was Philip Guston's favorite painting. And I know that it's considered to be one of the great enigmas. It's that Piero that has the three guys talking in the right foreground. And then there is a deep space, a deep recessional space with King Herod sitting in the chair watching the big guy getting whipped. You know, it's a flagellation. And I'd heard about this painting, and I'd seen it in reproduction, but I'd never seen it with my eyes until I was 50 years old. And I went with about 20 students from the Jerusalem Studio School, and we're in this room, and I was astonished by the qualities of response that I witnessed. I saw people entranced. One girl went back and sat down on a bench and started crying. Uh, I saw people standing there and looking and drawing for an hour and a half. And I asked myself, what's going on here? These are like young people from Israel. They don't even know who Jesus Christ is. You know, they weren't raised in that mythic narrative, um, under that narrative umbrella. What is this about? And that's when the lightning bolt really hit me, when I realized that it's not about subject matter at all. It's about qualities of abstraction. It's about how you arrange those shapes of tone and color in relationship to themselves, the same way that somebody's grandmother in, 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 in eastern Tuscany makes raviolis that, that just take you away with their sauce, 
you know, when you put a little cheese on them. It's, you know, it's like how you cook. It's right. how you cook. And, and how you cook with paint means that what you put within that square or within that rectangle is critical. How you arrange the parts in relationship to one another, the various weights, the disposition of form is what moves people. But what makes an artist is the degree to which you learn how to do your cooking over a long period of time. Yes, no, I agree with that. It, 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 it is the abstract qualities. It absolutely is those abstract qualities. Um, my daughter visited the other day. She's in college. And she's studying psychology. And I asked her what she was taught, learning and things like that. She goes, Dad, uh, perception is not reality. <laughs> That's what they learn. And, and we, and I think that that's kind of what we're up with against artists. So many painters are trying to make everything real on their canvas, and they're not realizing that this question, you know, why are we here, what are we doing here, all these qualities, they're not so uh, realistic. We're, we're dealing with abstract qualities constantly, and we're trying to organize this chaos. And... Um, those abstract qualities are, are more real than the things that we think are real. Oscar Wilde said, the only thing real is the canvas, it, is the painting itself. <laughs> I had a question that might be easier to answer than some of these really deep ones. Oh, I mean, these are the real ones. <laughs> no, I, I watched a video of you creating an abstract, and uh, you were uh, referring to and working with uh, notes and sketches that you had made on site, I think was in Philadelphia, or it might have been in Italy. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if all of your abstracts are specifically related to a a certain place or a certain physical uh, location, or do you just bring some of them up out of your head completely? Yeah, that's another that's another semester seminar question. Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, I don't. I, I make no differentiation between one kind of painting and another. Like the, this, these ideas of realism, abstraction, these are just arbitrary. These are just arbitrary names. Uh, painting is painting, and the thing that makes painting strong. I mean, the reason that we want to look at what we define as a good painting is a painting whose qualities of abstraction grab us. Now. It's true that some paintings are more descriptive than others, but let's ask ourselves, what are we describing? Are you still there, guys? Oh, yeah. Down. Yeah, we're yeah, going to down for a second, but we're all back. Right. Just like I said, hold on. It's like a horse. Yeah. You know, <laughs> hold on. the question is, what are we describing? We have no obligation to describe in a scientific way the appearance of things. We have no obligation in a scientific way to weigh and measure everything that's there. We're writing essentially something something between short stories and haiku or something between haiku and novellas. Um, that, I mean, so what's interested me in the last five years is our ways of describing experience without being in front of the place itself. Now, there are many ways of carrying away um, visual memory. Uh, let's start with even something so simple as this. I'm sitting here looking out my window, making a drawing of something that I see out my window, okay? so. I have this piece of paper, and I'm making a drawing of what's out my window. Now, I have to look up to look out the window, right? So I'm looking out the window. I'm having sensations. You know, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of what's out there, okay? I, I decide, ah, this is what I want. This is how I'm going to arrange the very complex configuration of studs out there. Now, I turn back to my piece of paper to start to draw. 
cut the film for a minute. What is that distance of time and space between when I looked out the window and I turned back to my paper? Okay, hold that thought. What is that interval of distance and what does it mean compared to I spend seven weeks in Italy making drawings, having experiences, falling in love with villages, drinking bottles of Montepulciano, walking around at night, harvesting immense amounts of experience and come back to my studio and five months later begin to create images from that summer, opening up all my sketchbooks, all the notes I made. I'm just asking a question rhetorically, what is the difference between those two things? In a certain sense, there is no difference. Well, the difference is that while I'm sitting here making the drawing out the window, I do have the constant presence of what is being observed, which is very important because when you are looking at something, there are certain things that can happen because you have, you have that, because you are returning to a configuration of something you're seeing, but in another way, it's all the same. So what's interested me in the last number of years is how can I carry away from a place a certain quality of engagement, of note-taking, of understanding, of digging in, and how can I reconstruct that in the studio to make sense of what my experience was in a way that is very different from what you can do when you are sitting in front of something and observing it. That's not something I could have done five years yeah. or ten years. I or don't know if I, I'm understanding it totally, but one of the things that I saw that um, you were explaining, the, the difference to me is one is based on total observation, almost in a stale mindset. The other one is based on some visual but a lot of experience. And I think that, that that's that part that people have tried to take out of painting, why their painting seems so stale, is they take the whole, I experienced this out of my painting. And the experience is, to me, almost stronger than the visual. And if you can allow the two to collide in your painting, then you're even much further out. So, yeah. I, I've found that in my paintings, the, the experience, and, and I could see that your experience might have been greater at one point. I mean, sometimes when you're just looking at the visual, doesn't your mind feel like it almost just goes on to pause? Like you'd almost want to have that experience happening? Yeah, well, we have to learn how to look. You know, that when, when I look at something, if I stand in front of something and I'm moved by it, if I'm painting outside or if I'm drawing outside, what I have to remind myself is that in order to convey a sense of what I'm experiencing to another person, I have to control the amount of information that I put into the reconstruction of that experience on my surface. That if I just start painting everything that I'm seeing, I'm not conveying my experience, which is, I think, is what you're describing. That right. if we're just conveying information, right. we're not really, I mean, we're trying to tap into an emotional place in a way. You know, a painting is more than just information. Stuart, I think we would benefit from having you come to uh, the Creative Underground and uh, putting on one of your workshops, possibly on <laughs> Steve. Uh, I said one year. Can I say something real quick while I'm thinking, while I'm thinking about it? Because I, I'm fairly new to painting, and one of the things that I'm learning as an artist is to 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 learn how to see, mm. to learn how to see shape and light and color. And it sounds to to me, and this is exciting because it's something I think I have to look forward to, but it's also kind of a heads up for me as an artist to start to begin to, to record 
the visual experiences, like you're saying, and, and it's been a process for you to learn how to do that. So then when you go back to the studio, you've got something something real. Because you've you've purposely recorded those experiences while you've been out and about. Yeah, so Beth, if you make a soup, you don't simply take everything in your fridge, everything in your cupboard, and everything on your shelves and throw it into the pot. You choose. Yeah, you learn. Mm -hmm. you know, that uh, that's awesome. Uh -huh. Writers have editors. We don't have editors. Yeah. We have to be our own editors. Um, if you go to the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia, which is a museum of rare books, they have the original manuscript there for this poem that T.S. Eliot wrote called The Wasteland. Now, T.S. Eliot was a young guy. He sent it to a, an older man who was like his mentor, Ezra Pound. He sent it to Ezra Pound, and Ezra Pound crossed out about half the lines. That's how the poem was published. We don't have editors. So our primary task in understanding painting is to learn in an ongoing way what editorial intervention means. You know what depth of focus is in a camera where in a camera if you focus on something that's close up what's in the background might be out of focus? It's called depth of field. The idea of it relates to painting. We can't, we cannot focus on everything that we see out there the same. Like if you have all this, like I'm looking out a window right now, and there are all these trees and houses and cardinals eating at the bird feeder, I can't look at it all simultaneously with the same weight of attention. I have to decide what are the primary relationships here, what am I looking at, and then I have to shape everything within and around that, resisting the temptation for those trees over there to say, up, 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 wait a minute, Shills, you're forgetting me, put me in also, and then I feel bad because I forgot to put the trees in, so I have to put them in. I mean, that's our curse, you know, when we go out to paint, that we think we have an obligation because you know, like in fourth grade, the teacher is going to come along and say, ah, 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 how about that, and how about that? Stuart, what would you say would be something we could tell a, a plein air painter that would really help them break out of the box, set their plein air painting on its ear? What, what would that one word be to you, um, a sentence? Help well, them? I mean, this, this is going to sound maybe a little cruel um, and maybe a little inappropriate but I would say stop looking at what in America we know are plein air paintings I mean like run away you know like because the pr like I, I teach I teach in a um, a wonderful art center in Sedona uh, every year and one year I was asked to be the juror for the plein air festival. All these people come to these places for these festivals and I was looking at these paintings that were submitted and I'm thinking to myself what on earth is going on here? Like people are not looking. They're, they're going out to paint but they're painting based on an idea of a template you know, of what a painting is. And I'm looking down the wall and all the paintings are the same. They're, they're all out of focus in the same way. They're all fuzzy in the same way. They use all the same fan brushes. Um, the subject matter is the same. And then there was like a young guy, I don't remember where he was from, from Los Angeles or whatever, and he somehow had fresh eyes. 
and he made these small paintings that just knocked my eyes out, and I gave him first prize, and people were like dumbfounded because he didn't fit the mold. So I would say throw the mold away. And right. look. Yeah, I, I call those Me Too painters. They want to paint like everybody else, and, and you'll see it at plain air uh, events that everything looks pretty much the same. Um, sometimes I'm a little unhappy with who uh, the ones they do pick because there's so many other paintings out there that I would say, wow, that's a painting, and then you know they don't see it that way. But um, it does come down to a, a personal opinion. I like that idea though that we need to have fresh eyes, and uh, I, I I I think that's another way of saying it that uh, have fresh eyes. You know, come to it with a new approach, a new way of seeing because. Uh, when you talk to painters and artists about seeing, I think they all think they already do see. But it, it, it's not really that we do see, because I know my seeing has changed. Every year I think I see way different than I ever saw the year before. And it, it's, every year it surprises me how much different. So yeah. um, how, how have you seen your, your ways of seeing it evolve over the, the uh, time period of, of your artist? Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're asking these questions that are like three week answers. Um, I give you three minutes. <laughs> everything is constantly evolving. I mean, one of the one of the things that I used to love about working outside, which I did religiously for 25 years, is that every place you go offers you a different way of seeing, that I really believe, and I was never a person to be constantly running around looking for new things. I chose a series of perches and I worked from them sort of constantly. Um, I mean in Philadelphia I might have had these different neighborhoods I worked in, but I would go back day after day to the same neighborhood. Then when I felt myself getting bored, I would shift neighborhoods. I can remember Every spring, I used to go out to Indiana. I used to go, it was about 19 miles in from the Ohio border. And it was so glorious to arrive there because it was so different from Philadelphia. People used to say to me in Philadelphia, what on earth are you doing out there in Indiana? It's like totally boring. Boring. It's flat, yes. But the whole point of being a painter is to discover that the ordinary is the extraordinary and to see deeply into a place beyond a cliche. So, mm. I mean, I, Indiana for me was like Mount Sinai. You know, I was, I was out of my mind out there painting. And then I used to love going to Ireland for the summer. You know, I lived in a village on the northwest coast. That was an insane experience. And then I would come back to the city and I would go to visit my sister in San Francisco. Oh my God, the first time I went to San Francisco and went up on Twin Peaks and looked down over the bay and across the Berkeley to this huge volume in the late afternoon of sunlight ripping across the bay and light coming up out of the water. I mean, the reason we go places is not to have dinner in a posh restaurant, but to like cows graze their way across a field as painters were eating our way into places visually. So the whole point for me of going outside and looking is to puncture the idea of cliché. You know, that's why we go out to look because everything is always new. That if, you're, if you are a person who is able to bring your eyes Honestly, when you walk out of the house in the morning to seeing, not to looking, but to seeing, then everything is going to be constantly amazing. And that, I think, is what education is about. You know, I had an uncle who was a Life magazine photographer, and I became very interested in the camera as a young man. And I remember my uncle said to me, if you want to, if you want to be a photographer, you have to learn how to see. And to learn how to see, you have to go to art school. 
Now, I never went to art school until after I went to college because I didn't live in a family where going to art school was possible. You know, my parents were first generation, you know, we were like immigrants and going to art school was not such an easy thing to do. But learning how to see is very different than looking. And for anybody, and, and so seeing requires work. Looking does not, you know, turning the pages of a magazine, looking on the internet, that's not seeing, that's just looking. Now you've explained that very well, and, and I like the way that you talk about, because I've experienced that too, when you go to a different location, uh, I've, I've seen different things, even in my painting, that every place does have something to offer, and if, if someone had an idea that, oh no, I already know how to see, I don't need to learn how to see, that was a very good way of explaining it, that uh, we all need to learn to see. We need to develop those awesome. and, uh, Right, like, like we're always learning. Like we're never done, right, Daryl? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always the student. I tell my students I am on no firmer footing than they are. I've done <laughs> work, but, you know, we are, I mean, you never get, you never arrive. It is a constant turning over a constant turning the page. And the other thing I wanted to say, that using different materials for me is critical. That I can remember the first summer that I went to Ireland, I worked for what, I don't know, whatever it was, like I worked for seven weeks and then realized I had several more weeks, but I had to let my paintings dry. Um, so I worked in acrylic. And acrylic blew my mind away. I'd never worked in acrylics before, but I figured these are going to dry fast. Acrylic opened up all kinds of things. It taught me so much about the potential for oil painting because the way the acrylic bit on the paper informed a sense of maybe a new seed of aspiration for oil paint. And then if you draw in graphite, you know, with a pencil, if you then pick up a litho crayon, that's a whole different animal. Um, so for me, and now I work in collage, monotype, oil pastel. I mean, all these things inform each other because it's all part of one stream of conversation. So if I'm ever a little bit bored, or you know, if I'm like at a point where I just you know, I can't get around a, a tree that fell across the path. I just choose a different material or a different way of working wow. that requires asking different questions. So, so we were talking about locale before or location, but I would say that materials play a kind of similar role potentially. I appreciate that. That's very good. Well, I think um, we have done <laughs> way more than I thought, and, then, and I've learned so much from you, Stuart. I just really appreciate talking to you. Okay. Um, I think we can finish up this interview, and I still want you to stay online for a few minutes because we have a couple other questions to ask you about. But I, I do really want to bring you here and offer your, your talents to those people that want to learn to see a little bit more. And so I want to thank everybody that turned in today to watch Stuart. And Beth and Bob, thank you so much for being here with us also. Thank you, guys. Privilege. It was, it was great. Really great. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for your time, Stuart. I really appreciate oh, it. Sure.